Hi, everyone. I'm Marcelina Pedraza, but most people call me Marcy. Uh, I've been a union electrician for 24 years now from the southeast side of Chicago, born and raised. I live and work here still, and um, I'm passionate about uh, workers' rights and environmental justice. I'm a member of United Auto Workers Local 551 and an International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And I'm a mom and a dog owner. My name is Therese Sawyer. I am from UAW Local 7, Jefferson North, also known as Detroit Assembly Complex Jefferson. Um, I've been there since um, 96. I started off as a TPT, uh, got hired in full-time 1998. Um, I mean, I'm part of the rank and file. I work in 9194 um, and final assembly, which where we call rows and narrows. And um, we check the headlights and actually drive the vehicle to make sure that it's inspection. So, Nicholas Livick, um, member of UAW Local 31 in uh, Kansas uh, City. Um, I. <laughs> I, in three days, I would have been with uh, General Motors for a decade. Um, where does the time go? Um, I'm passionate about just anything labor related. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for setting up this panel, Max. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today. Brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor, and made possible by the support of listeners like you. Working People is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. If you're hungry for more worker and labor-focused shows like ours, follow the link in the show notes and go check out the other great shows in our network. And please, please support the work that we are doing here at Working People so we can keep growing and keep bringing y'all more important conversations every week. You can support us by leaving us a positive review of the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can share these episodes on your social media, and you can share them with your coworkers, your friends, and your family members. And of course, the single best thing you can do to support our work is become a paid monthly subscriber on Patreon for just five bucks a month. If you subscribe for 10 bucks a month, you'll also get a print subscription to the amazing In These Times magazine mailed to your door every month. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, but you want to get access to all of our great bonus episodes and support the show, just head on over to patreon.com slash working people. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash working people. Hit the subscribe button. And you will immediately unlock a whole lot of awesome bonus content that we publish regularly for our subscribers. Uh, we just posted a really killer bonus episode with my man Tom Sexton from the Trillbillies where we dug into uh, the Oliver Anthony phenomenon, uh, the, the kind of country music, working class, you know, stuff that's going on. So me and Jules had a great chat with Tom about that. You guys don't want to miss that. So Thank you to everyone who is a subscriber already. You guys are the ones who keep the show going. My name is Maximilian Alvarez, and I am very excited and grateful uh, to be joined on this special Working People recording. Uh, you guys heard we've got uh, my man Nick Livick, we've got Marcy, we've got Torres, we've got an incredible panel of UAW members uh, who are, as you may have heard, uh, in the midst of a critical contract fight uh, with the big three auto makers. And um, we are recording this panel on Wednesday, September 6th. We're going to try to turn it around as quickly as we can uh, because things are heating up right now. Right. The current UAW master agreement with the big three automakers expires on September 14th. And uh, just earlier today, uh, UAW President Sean Fain uh, said in very clear terms that if 
any of the big three automakers does not have a um, contract offer on the table by then, uh, they will see their workers strike. So uh, we're really coming down to the showdown here. This is a pivotal contract campaign uh, involving, you know, a, a, a whole lot of workers in a critical industry. And so we wanted to bring Nick, Marcy and Torres on uh, to sort of give you all an up to date view of what things are looking like from their vantage points, um, what they are fighting for, along with their co-workers uh, in this contract fight and why it's so important that all of us rally around them and support them. Uh, until they get the contract that they deserve. So I'm going to turn it over to our incredible panel in just a second. But as, as we always do, we want to make sure that our listeners have at least some baseline context to understand the rest of the conversation that we're going to have today. So uh, I just wanted to read uh, a couple passages from a great breakdown that was published last month at Labor Notes uh, by the great Dan DiMaggio and Keith Brower Brown. And of course, we're going to link to this in the show notes, along with other helpful links for y'all so you can keep reading up on this contract fight. Um, and the, the, the major changes that have happened within the UAW in recent years, uh, which we're also going to talk about today. But just to sort of give you all some of that baseline context, um, Dan DiMaggio and Keith Brower Brown write in Labor Notes, quote, the clock is ticking towards September 14th at midnight when the auto workers' contracts with the big three automakers expire. The new leaders of the UAW have come out swinging, and in quickly growing numbers, members are stepping up to prepare for a strike. The agreements cover close to 150,000 workers at Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis. In early August, President Sean Fain presented a list of the members' demands to the companies, calling them, quote, the most audacious and ambitious list of proposals they've seen in decades, end quote. These bargaining goals are aimed at undoing concessions extracted by the companies from previous union administrations since before the Great Recession. A major goal is to ensure that the transition to electric vehicles is not used to further undermine auto workers' standards. Entering this round of bargaining, the big three have reported a combined $21 billion in profits in the first half of 2023. This comes on top of profits of $250 billion over the last 10 years. Quote, our message going into bargaining is clear. Record profits mean record contracts, Fain told UAW members on Facebook Live August 1st. Instead of the UAW's past tradition of targeting just one auto company and bargaining, then basing contracts for the others off that model, Fain warned all three companies to consider themselves targets, keeping them guessing about which one may ultimately be struck or whether union members might walk out at all three. In 2019, 49,000 UAW members struck GM for six weeks. Among the demands Fain presented are eliminating tiers on wages and benefits plus double-digit raises for all, restoring cost-of-living adjustments, which were suspended during the Great Recession, restoring the defined benefit pension and retiree health care for all. Workers hired since 2007 have neither. Increasing pensions for current retirees. There's been no increase since 2003. The right to strike over plant closures. A, quote, working family protection program, which means if the company shut down a plant, they would have to pay laid off workers to do community service work. Making all current temps permanent employees with strict limits on the future use of temps and increasing paid time off, end quote. All right. So that's just kind of the opening uh, salvo here. Let's dig in deep to the rest of this historic contract fight with our incredible panelists. Um, Marcy, I want to start with you and and, and ask if, um, you know, we could you know, go around the table as we love to do on this show. We want to get to know more about our fellow workers, you know, like how you came to do this work. What was the path that led you uh, to doing the kind of job that you do now? Uh, what does that job look like? Because most of us will have 
literally no idea uh, what you three like do on a day to day basis and, and we're hungry to learn about it. Um, so, yeah, tell us a little more about your own path into the auto industry, the kind of work that you do and the kind of issues that you have seen and experienced firsthand that are, you know, really at issue here in this contract fight. Yeah. So thanks for having me again. Um, so as I said, I, I'm an electrician. I started in construction, but, um, you know, as we know, that can be kind of a on and off again type job, you know, where you have to go look for work. And sometimes, you know, you're not working for weeks at a time and you might lose your benefits. So actually it was back in 2013 or 2012 when Chrysler at the time, Chrysler called me, they found my resume online. They said, Hey, we need more tradespeople." And I was like, where is this plant? They said, Belvedere. I was like, I don't know where that is. They said, it's right near Chicago. I'm like, that's nowhere near Chicago. <laughs> it's near Rockford. So anyway, I moved my my family in 2013 to move to Belvedere to work at Chrysler Belvedere Assembly Plant, which has now been idled. Um, and, you know, it was just for something more steady. You know, I took a pay cut at first because, you know, coming from the outside to the inside, it was, it was a big pay cut, but steady work great benefits, you know, um, all that stuff. And I was there three and a half years. And then even though I was always back and forth home, coming home to Chicago where I'm from. So then I saw that Ford was hiring and now I work at Ford Chicago assembly plant here on the Southeast side, um, which is right near 10 minutes from where I live. And um, I've been fortunate to be there seven years, but I've done all kinds of things from, you know, babysitting robots, <laughs> troubleshooting, um, working on panels, uh, VFDs, you know, <laughs> there's a lot. And, and, and now I do more like, um, preventive maintenance, uh, work with the, in the paint department. So making sure all the trades have their, you know, work tickets and creating work orders based on what kind of maintenance needs to be done in our, in our department. So it's, it's been, uh, you know, uh, a lot of learning experience, especially coming from the outside doing pipe and wire. I come to this industry and they're like, oh, what do you know about PLCs? I'm like, well, I had a class and apprenticeship program, but I never use it on the outside, you know, but I, I've learned a lot and had robotics training. And um, yeah, so it's just been, you know, a great experience, uh, you know, learning new things. But, um, you know, it's also you know, it's, it's a time where like, we're, we're, we're realizing that like, I've been, you know, in the UAW 10 years now, and this past contract, we've only received a 3% raise every two years. So that's 6% over the last four years. And it's, that doesn't even catch up or, you know, it doesn't even uh, compare to inflation, which has been like more than three times that, you know, so when they say, oh, look, you're getting this raise or this lump sum bonus, you know, it's, it's just, it it's the, the bonuses just come and go, you know, they don't like, that's why we're fighting for cost of living allowance. Cause that's permanent, you know? Well, me as myself, um, me being at Jefferson North assembly plant, I work in final. I've worked in all the departments in assembly trim chassis final. A um, little bit in body shop when I was a TPT. And I began, when I began working there in 96, I actually left another facility that used to build parts for um, Chrysler. And that was the Sebring. And I got a phone call from my girlfriend, like, hey, my aunt work at an um, uh, unemployment agency. She told us to come down and fill out the app. And I'm like, back. I'm like, so we rushed down there. We fill out the app. And it's been, yeah, almost 27 years, counting the TPT time, that I've been at um, Jefferson North Assembly Plant. And, and back then, we was at minimum wage in that was minimum, literally like, I want to say seven, eight dollars an hour. So when I came to Chrysler, that was such a blessing for me because I had already had purchased a house at the age of 21. So that was like 
oh my God, I was at 12. We started at 12.54. And now the kids starting at like $17, $18. And when I tell them I started at 12.54, they like, here? You was making only $12.54 working here? They like really thrown back with that. And I was like, Chrysler was like everything back in 96 just to try to get back in a in the big three because it was so hard to get in GM for a Chrysler. So and I remember filling out the app. I put all of it, part-time, full-time, anytime. Just let me get my foot in the door. So I was very happy to come and work at Chrysler because like I said, back then, it just meant everything, and you was not getting that type of pay. Um, I was just like almost like three, four years out of school, out of high school, and I didn't immediately go to school, to college. I did have some experience with community college at the time, but with that rate, it was like really unheard of. So... I, I felt like uh, working at the big three was like a blessing to me and my family. And I have three boys that have come up in the ranks, not at Chrysler, but off, off our, um, off our livelihood. That's, uh, it's powerful listening to everyone's stories. Um, my, mine actually starts in the, in the sixties, my grandfather hired into AMC Kenosha, um, when that closed down, he got hired into Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, my mom, <clears throat> sorry, I'm battling a little bit of the cold. The kids got me. Um, my mom uh, got hired in. Uh, I think she's a 96 or two. Um, and then, you know, the recession hit and we were forced to move. Uh, our plant closed. Um, so we packed everything up and we, we, uh, my mom waited until she got her final offer and Kansas city was it. So, uh, I was like, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm ready for an adventure. It's my senior year of high school. Um, so we, we moved down here and then, uh, I went back to Wisconsin, um, went to college, um, put my name in there. Like, like they said, it was, it was like impossible to get in, you know, it's a lottery system. At least it was for me. You're just waiting to see if your name gets pulled. Um, and I finally got called. I was like a semester away from my associate's degree. And I was, I was just, I remember sitting at my table, just doing the math. I was like, man, I could continue. I could get this degree. I could graduate. I could have all this student debt, or I can go and, and, you know, follow in the footsteps of my family. And, and hopefully, you know, I was, I was looking at the past experiences. Um, it was good enough for my grandfather to move his family out of a double wide into a home. Um, it was good enough for my mom to actually buy her first new car ever. Um, after she got hired in, I mean, these jobs used to be life changing jobs. Um, it, it set the standard, um, for, for not just manufacturing, but all of them, the, the working class in America, um, so I got hired in and I just kind of bounced around. Um, I've done, I've done just about everything. I'm, I'm in general assembly. So we, we do all the inside of the vehicle. Um, I've done material. I've been back in body shop. I've been a, a team leader right now. I'm in the pool. Um, so I can go to any job in my group. Um, and I'm just pretty much expected to be able to walk onto that job or do that job with minimal training. Um, and I could even be removed from my group and sent to another group, um, because I'm a pool guy. Um, so I could go to, to group one and it's the same kind of conditions, you know, you're, 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 tr you're trying to free up a team leader, um, <clears throat> or, or somebody else, get them off the line. So, you know, they can watch your brothers and sisters or, or the people, people in their area, um, so you're just, you're, you're expected to be able to kind of walk onto this job, um, that would take, you know, some people, you know, four hours a day, three days, um, and you're just expected to, to walk on and, and do it. Um, so I, that's just, I mean, I could be doing anything on any given day and I, I like it that way. I like to bounce around. Some people, some people don't like it. Um, but I've found through my 10 years is like when you get um, to one job, I mean, people don't realize you're stuck in the same 
like 10 feet area for hours and hours. I mean, your, your life kind of turns into a Dr. Seuss book, one car, two car, red car, blue car. Um, so I, I, I love to bounce around. Um, so <clears throat> that's, that's just a little bit about me. Well, I want to, I want to actually pick up on that real quick and do like a sort of mini round around the table. Cause, cause y'all are doing such different jobs or it, you could do a different job depending on what day of the week it is. Right. And so I just wanted to uh, give listeners like a sense of like what a typical week looks like if there is such a thing for you. Like, cause again, like this is, we're talking about the auto industry. Like we know in general that it's hard work, but I still think a lot of people don't know what that entails. So like just to give folks more of a sense uh, of like the real day to day grind that we're talking about here, could we go back around the table and just, yes, yeah, like, tell me uh, like what a typical week looks like for you. Like how long are you working? What's your commute? Like, what does it look like in there? Just, just give folks more of a sense of what you go through on a week to week basis. Okay. I'll start. And I wanted to add some other stuff from before that I didn't say. So you can put this in later if you want. Um, also, I wanted to uh, mention that I'm a fourth generation union worker. Uh, my family, I come from a long line of steel mill workers and railroad workers um, that worked in the Southeast side, you know, before the steel mills closed and, and, uh, basically, you know, like just left their community in despair. Um, but a typical week, let's see for trades, basically trades, we keep the line running. Right. And this production knows when the line stops, you know, the management all of a sudden, you know, right away, they're calling for maintenance to come out with their electricians usually first. And, um, it's something that, that we can't, correct, then, you know, we might need a mill right or a pipe fitter, depending on the problem, you know, and at my plant, they, uh, trades work, uh, 12 hour shifts and it's usually three or four days a week or five or two days a week. And it's weird the weekend and it's every other weekend day or night. So it could be a long, a long day or a long night. Um, and it could be, um, you know, you, you could do anything from just making your rounds, making sure everything's running correctly, servicing equipment and during the little breaks or lunch or shift change, you know, changing parts, um, making sure that uh, everything's ready for the next shift. Or sometimes, you know, when uh, when something breaks down, you know, they're on us like, like all the bosses come from everywhere in the planet, it seems, and they're like hovering over you, bird dogging us, like, why isn't it running? Why isn't it running? You know, seconds is is money. And it's just like every second that the line is down and freaking out. So we could be like running around, like trying to, to you know, reset a, a panel or a robot or trying to like get the, the ovens back up and running, you know, in the paint shop. And and then some of these conditions, you know, are really hot, like, most of the plants don't have air conditioning. You know, I don't know, but some areas do, but it's mainly to protect the equipment, like in a paint shop, you know? Um, so we could be running to the roof to, to check the RTOs or, you know, working right near an oven, which, you know, just because it's turned off, it's still like, like really hot around those ovens. Um, you know, I remember working one breakdown, we were <laughs> pretty much every electrician in, in that department working on this, uh, communication issue. And we were there for hours and like they had to bring us water and, you know, we were just melting and for the time we were done, we had to change our coveralls because everyone was just soaking wet, but you know, not every day is like that. It's just, like, it just depends on, on what's going on. You know, like a lot of these plants run, I know our plant runs 24 seven and there's hardly any time to do the basic maintenance that we need to do to keep the plant running in an efficient manner. You know, they want they just want to make make cars and produce. And a lot of times, you know, they don't care about the conditions of the equipment. Um, you know, they're like, oh, let's work a super Saturday, super Sunday. It's like, all right, well, where's our 24 hour time that we have to go in and like fix the problems so that you don't have these breakdowns, you know, throughout the week or the next shift even. But they don't really look into that, I guess. Well, for me, um, I am over in 91, 94, which we call Rose and Marrows. And I am working. We actually, they actually have our plant at critical status, meaning um, we're supposed to be actually working Sundays too as production. 
we only work one production Sunday. Um, thank God, because we still been on six days, 10 hours. Um, in my department, we also do reprocessing, meaning um, the unavailables, vehicles that have defects, we actually come in and we have to process those cars through rows and marrows. So if they're not working on a Sunday, we are canvassed to work overtime on a Sunday in our area. So some last month, I believe, yeah, the last two months, I could say I had almost worked, and I was counting, about 23 days straight. And I was like, I was like, I can't, when they come around and ask for overtime or ask, could I come in and on a Sunday or Saturday, if it was an off Saturday, I'm like, I got to turn it down because I know at this point, my body is going to break down. Um, I'm just barely just like getting over a cold myself. And, and I know my immune system will just, uh, just automatically break down. So we are literally, we're working nonstop as well. And we felt like that because they felt like we may strike, they was kind of stockpiling the cars as well, just trying to build whatever they could build. And we get it on the back end. We'll repair those cars on the back end. So at the same time, you you want the money because you don't know if you're going to go on strike and you want to try to put money aside. And then I still have a 13-year-old that's in school, my last Mohican, I call him, um, that I had to school shop for and things of that nature. And just going to the grocery store and spending $250 at Costco's like nothing. And then I still have to go to Myers and buy some of the stuff that they didn't have at Costco's. So I'm spending a good $400 at least on groceries. So I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating the overtime, but at the same time, I'm, I'm getting burnt out. We are, we are really getting burnt out and I try not to complain and I thank God for the job, for the opportunity, but at the same time, we are getting burnt out. And I, uh, I, I mean, the nature of my job is I, I never know what's going to go on. Um, but when I was, when I was a team leader to, to kind of tag on what Marcy said, I mean, when the moment that line goes down and like, it's, it's, it's a high stress situation because the moment you go, your your line goes down the moment a job and your team goes down management's right there on the radio and they're like what's going on at 154 what's going on at 210 like what what is and it's like i mean it's it's only been like five seconds guys let me let me at least get up out of my chair and walk over there um so like you just gotta you gotta like just just imagine that you there's a never ending stream of work as far as your eye can see. And you're just sitting there in the same 15 foot footprint and you're walking back and forth. And this isn't like a, a slow walk. This is, this is, you got to keep up or that line is going down. And if that line goes down and if it goes down too many times, management's going to be standing there bird dog and you watching. Um, so you're, you're standing there, you're walking back and forth. You're probably going to walk 10 to 15 miles a night just in that same 15 foot footprint um you're going to be adding parts to the car um the jobs at my plant run at about 58 seconds so every 58 seconds you got a new job um but but you can't even really look at it at the tack time or the the job time it's more of the load time so at our plant a lot of our jobs are 98 percent plus loaded so these are busy jobs and even the jobs that are less loaded it, well it's because <clears throat> the uh management came through with their little stopwatch because they'll do this every year and they'll time the job but they shave off half seconds quarter seconds 
and they make the job work on paper and then they stand back and scratch their head wondering why the line keeps on going down well because last year it took me two seconds to do this push pin and now it only takes me one second to do the push pin so you do the math um and it's 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 hard work there's a lot of facilities I'm actually kind of fortunate. My facility is climate controlled. So during the the heat of the summer, you know, it could be 110 outside and uh, we're lucky and it's the plant staying at about 90 degrees, you know, but that's still, that's still hot for physical labor. Um, you go over uh, to 249, the Ford plant, and they're not climate controlled. Um, they're, they're out there. If it's uh, 110 outside, you know, it's 120 in the factory and they're getting heat relief breaks. They're getting literally people are wheeling water up and down the aisles just to, to give people water breaks. I mean, it's it's insane that we are in 2023 and we can't even have like basic conditions inside of the factories. And then you think about the dock workers, you know, they're driving into these semi trucks that are really nothing more than convection ovens when it's this hot outside. Um, and then you go in the winter time and then it's freezing cold. Um, so there's just, there's a, there's a lot of, of things in my, in my 10 years before I turned 27, I'm 31 now, before I turned 27, I had trigger finger, carpal tunnel in both my wrists, frozen shoulder. Um, I had <laughs> blown out my back because I was on a job where I was literally bending over 90 degrees. So you, you do that for 420 times a night, do that times, times that by five or six, you know, and that's how many cars you're doing in a week. Um, and, and my plants, one of the lucky ones, we do nine hour shifts. Um, we're, we're only slated to do eight. Um, but we've been doing an hour of mandatory overtime. Um, We've been scheduled a lot of Saturdays. Right now, the supply chain's so wonky that they've been canceling them. They'll schedule it. And this is another great thing that management does. They'll schedule a Saturday. And then before the weekend comes, they're like, oh, we don't actually need you guys. Like it's Wednesday. And it's like, oh, thanks. You know, I could have gone out on, uh, I could have gone out and enjoyed the time with my family. But instead, you know, so we we can't have vacations where we're in there in in sweltering conditions. You know, the work has gotten it's essentially a speed up um, because the work has gotten so bad and so busy that, that even if, even if, if a, something as simple as a wire comes tangled to you down the line, the line's going down. Um, so it's really dependent. Like everybody needs to do their job a hundred percent every single time. And if you miss something, the, the next job's going to go down and then that person's in the hole. So then that person's run trying to catch up and while that person's catching up well guess what happened to the person down the line from them well they got in the hole so i mean it's a it's a just a cascading uh, uh effect um so that that kind of gives you a idea of what it's like to work the line it's hectic it's it's stressful but you do get your good days you know where where everything just seems to be working and you can just kind of listen to your music and or audio books. That's how I'm a big fan of audio books um, and just kind of zone out because you've been on the job for so long that it's almost like your body's busy, but your mind's free. Mm, man. But I'll tell you one thing, my body's aching just listening to this. <laughs> like, my, like I got a shitty back and a bad knee and they're both hurting listening to you guys talk. And like speaking as, a former warehouse worker in Southern California, I, I know what it's like going into those trucks in the middle of summer. Like when you say it's like a convection oven, you're not you're not kidding. Like you go out into the sun to cool off after coming out of one of those goddamn trucks. But I mean, like and, and even just hearing this. Right. I mean, I think folks can start to put together, you know, like why y'all just as workers in the auto industry who have such high demands put on you and your bodies and your brains and your coworkers and the different departments and, and the speed ups that, that affect your lives in the ways that y'all enumerated. I mean, even just thinking about that, the kind of working conditions and, and what it does to you as human beings trying to meet those quotas in such a high pressure uh, and, and kind of high uh, stakes 
environment because we're also talking i mean we're talking industrial manufacturing this is dangerous work too uh you gotta you gotta know what you're doing keep your wits about you all that good stuff so even just from the that side the daily work side i can see why y'all are you know fighting so hard to to get a better contract that will make sure that you're paid adequately for that um, better protect workers like yourselves who are in that situation. That all already makes a ton of sense. But of course, we're talking about like there's a lot of other context here uh, behind this contract fight, right? And and I just wanted to kind of like lay out uh, sort of like how I come to it as an outside observer, just trying to sort of think about from my own vantage point, like you know the changes that have happened to this industry. Um, and I mean, you know, geez, you know, Teresa, you, you know, you, you can be talking about this going back to the late nineties. You've seen these firsthand. I mean, all of you have seen this firsthand, but I'm just speaking for myself. I remember when the economy cratered, uh, you know, in 2008, my family, like so many others lost everything, including the house that I grew up in. That's where this show started years ago. Um, but I remember those days, I remember the auto industry almost collapsing. I remember the American taxpayers bailing out, uh, you know, two of the auto manufacturers to the tune of $80 billion. I remember uh, workers like yourselves taking concessions, you know, giving concessions at that moment. And all like all of us around the country, it was like, look, we're in a crisis. We got to tighten our belts. We got to do what we can to keep this ship afloat. That was the mentality we were all in at that moment. And you guys and your co-workers showed up, right? You, you did what you had to do to keep the auto industry afloat. And you were explicitly promised by the big three automakers that you would get those concessions back when things turned around when they were back in the black, when we weren't, you know, on the lip of a volcano, like, you know, facing imminent collapse. Fast forward, right, uh, a couple years, right? And, and, and like I said, I started this show, um, and the first person I ever interviewed for it was my dad, Jesus Alvarez. We talked about losing everything in the recession. I was learning more about the what workers across the country were going through when I started this show back in uh, 2018. And one of the, the first big story that I, I just got obsessed with was the GM layoffs in 2018. Uh, I talked to folks in Ohio. I talked to folks in Michigan where I was living at the time. Uh, I talked to folks in Oshawa, in Canada, um, people who were telling me that the Monday after Thanksgiving uh, break, people who came back and were told that GM was eliminating 14,000 jobs, including white and blue collar jobs, and they were profitable. This was when uh, GM was back in the black. This was after GM got a massive tax cut from, you know, like everybody else, uh, every other corporation from, from you know, the, these assholes in Washington, like the Job Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? So they get these windfall profits from these tax cuts. There, you all made uh, this industry profitable after the Great Recession. And how were you repaid? With more layoffs, with closures or idling, they always love to idle plants because they can't. They don't say they're going to close them. They just say, oh, we're not using it right now, but it effectively has the same effect. Uh, that's what happened to Lordstown, the storied plant in Lordstown, Ohio, right? I mean, this is, what, this is what's been happening in plants all across the country. And right now, we're talking about uh, an auto industry that is not where it was in 2008. In fact, I'm looking at the great background that Marcy has on our Zoom, uh, you know, including the, the, the rallying cry for uh, the whole UAW. Sean Fain's been saying it. Record profits equal record contracts. So we've come a long way from 2008. And I'm just kind of, again, giving like my own sort of trying to put the pieces together as I've seen it over these past 15 years, I wanted to turn it back over to you guys and ask just like, what other, what are, what context do people need to understand what brought us to this point? Like, why is this contract fight so significant? And I mean, we haven't even touched on the, the reform movement within the UAW. You guys took 
control of your union. You got rid of a of a of a one party uh, administration that had ruled uh, for like seventy years. Like, I mean, there, there's so much that has happened in this time, and I'm sorry I'm talking so long. It's just like this is such a, a an important fight that I'm hoping folks uh, I'm communicating effectively for folks. But I want to turn it back over to y'all and ask just like. Yeah, how do how should we be framing this? Like, what is the context that led us to the point where we could see a major auto industry strike within the next two weeks? Um, yeah, well, let me. Uh, you got me thinking about about my story too. So let me take it back even further to like the seventies and eighties. You know, when um, Chicago made like the steel that that built our city and the skyscrapers across the country, right? And, you know, when those mills closed in, in my neighborhood in the southeast side of Chicago, it was devastating for our community. You know, like at some point there was, I think, uh, I don't know, 100,000 100, or so workers in the mills, maybe more. And um, those companies just left. There's a great documentary about when Wisconsin Steel closed called Exit Zero by Christine Watley. And my dad worked at, at Wisconsin Steel and um, he was laid off. And then eventually they just locked the gates and you know, kicked everybody out. They took their pensions. They took their last couple paychecks. I mean, uh, yeah, I've seen what it does to a community. And like, uh, that's what uh, reminds me or makes me think about Belvedere. And if if I were still working there, I don't know if I would still be in the plant because there is a skeleton crew of trades in the plant, you know, taking things apart and shipping it somewhere. I don't know <laughs> where, but um you know, it would be devastating to the community of Belvedere. It's a small town. You know, they they rely heavily on on you know that all those jobs, and um, so just you know, in in these last few years, you know, workers are are getting fed up, and we're 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 tired. We've given so much, and the companies just keep taking and taking. And you know, we worked in 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 a global pandemic risking our health and safety for them to make profits off of our labor. And that's why you've seen like so many, you know, more strikes happening. I was just reading in the Washington Post um, about like, this is the most strikes this year since the beginning, since before the pandemic, right? Because, you know, it started when, um, well, most of us went back to work, like after a couple months, right? Whereas a lot of people, especially the salary workers at Ford, got to work remotely, you know? It's not an option for, for most workers. And um, kind of jumping around a bit. But yeah, you know, like the it started with the, the Kellogg strike, I think. And then, um, you know, Caterpillar, John Deere, you know, SAG-AFTRA, and just countless uh, CTU, Chicago Teachers Union, you know, um, huge uh organizers in the labor movement and it's really making people like like come together because you know we're not we shouldn't just classify ourselves as lower middle upper class like i have a, a family member who thinks that you know they're comfortable they're upper middle class i'm like yeah you still go to work every day right your wife goes to work every day you're you're working for a paycheck like you're you're not you know you're not part of that one or ten percent even you know we're all working people we're all working class but corporations and, and, you know, the billionaires want us to, to fight each other and say, well, no, they don't deserve this. And, you know, McDonald's workers don't deserve that or, you know, Starbucks workers, you know, but it's like what they're getting what they want. They're getting us to, to fight each other when really we should be fighting them because <laughs> there's more of us than them, you know? So I'll just, oh, well, I was going to add too about, um, well, issues with, with the trades specifically, like, you know, it, it seems like like with production and trades wages, they're pretty close. You know, we make probably a couple bucks more an hour. Um, so it's almost like if, you know, sometimes your production, you want to get in the trades, they think, oh, it's going to be it's going to be easy. And, you know, <laughs> it's not easy, but they're easier. Um, but it's a lot of training and, and it, they might think it might not even be worth it just for just a few bucks more. And right now we're facing, you know, like it's there's more trades retiring, you know, the, the boomers, you know, most of the trades, I think over 50% are over the age of 45, you know, so we're going to need a lot more people getting in the trades. But if these wages stay stagnant the way they have been, nobody's going to want to do that, you know, but when I started in, in 99, it was ideal for me because I, I just, I went to University of Southern California for two years, couldn't afford to finish because the school was just so expensive. But as soon as I got in the apprenticeship, you know, I was able to pay off my college loans, buy a house, you know, stuff like that. But 
So yeah, they're going to have to, th these companies are going to have to pay up and, and to be competitive if they want to have a, a, a strong and, and, you know, a good workforce. COVID. And it's before then, but really when COVID happened, when the, when the pandemic happened, people was literally fed up. That, that was like a, a, a real kicker because I just remember how they had Taco Bell's open, McDonald's, all these fast food places open. Don't want a pandemic. Like, people were dying, you know what I'm saying, of COVID, and y'all felt like that was important to keep these places open. I literally felt like the only thing that should have been open maybe was the gas station, gross stores that that was the essential worker they included um the um, price of workers gm for they considered us essential workers and they was also i remember looking at cnn saying like we supposed to be getting hazard pay like the people even at the restaurant should they get in hazard pay of because they was basically taking the risk of going to work every day and catching COVID. You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking like where where I hazard pay at? Because I remember like our life had changed. We got the temperature, we can uh, making sure we ain't got a uh, a cold and all this crap. We got the the plastic um dividers that's kind of dividing us sitting at the table when that really happened and they really expected us to come in and i remember getting angry when people was coming running late because you literally was trying to find a babysitter uh someone watch your kids what you talking about they tardy they need to have a babysitter you couldn't even take your People couldn't even take their kids over people's houses and the grandmother houses, the grandfather houses, because they didn't want to get them sick. So it was like we, that really opened people's eyes. Like they didn't want to work here. They didn't want to work. They like F this job. You know what I'm saying? Literally, they and this, a lot of people didn't even come back. After that, because they were so afraid of catching COVID, but just everything just, they felt like they weren't getting enough money. Just everything just start coming in on people. And they just felt like they was unappreciated. Um, of course, they like the wages is not enough. It wasn't nothing enough. For our, as, as I remember, that's what they, that's what they told us. Like y'all, y'all is killing the, the unemployment. So y'all need to hurry up and go back to work. And we literally was off maybe even at maybe the two months. But that's what really kind of kicked up all the smoke, even with everything that's going on. COVID to me really just had people just fed up. Just like, oh, this is not enough. You know, you seeing your coworkers die. We was, oh my God, just family members dying. You know what I'm saying? It, and it was, we just was exhausted. During the pandemic, people didn't, literally didn't come back. They didn't come back to work. And we wasn't having enough people. The TPTs was literally used every day. Supplemental workers, whatever they want to call them. I, I think of a supplement as a vitamin, but they called um, them supplemental workers. They literally worked every day because people didn't come back to work. So I, I, I really felt like COVID was, that that was the kicker of people just being fed up and not being appreciated and really wanting more. Getting back to the, the pandemic, you know, I just remembered, you know, I was like paying a small mortgage for childcare and a lot of working parents were doing the same. You know, I'm a one parent household and even with just one kid, you know, I couldn't leave my kid home alone and they were doing a remote or online learning. So I had to pay someone to be at my house, someone that was willing to go into a house where they know that that person that lives there is going to a place every day with thousands of other people. So risking them, you know, 
risking getting sick themselves. And like I said, you know, it was like paying, it was like paying another mortgage payment or a car payment. And, you know, the little stimulus checks we got here and there that didn't really make up for it. But that went on for like a year, I guess. I don't even know. So I really think COVID was a great reset for a lot of workers. Um, you know, when you get that time off and you're you're at home and you're rediscovering, you know, the people <laughs> in your in your life. I mean, I was my plant was laid off for about eight months and I had just had my son. Um, so I had for the eight, first eight months of his life, you know, I got to watch him grow. And it's like every single day, you know, he's hitting a new milestone. And then, you know, a month down the road, you're like you're holding him and you're like, hold on, you used to just cover part of my chest and now your legs are dangling off. What the hell happened here? Um, so, I mean, I just think it was a, it was a really big reset. And another thing that, that people need to understand is like, we're not, we're not complaining. Um, every single person on this call, like this is, this is something that's really deep within the big three. Like we might, we might joke around and give each other shit. Um, like, Oh, Ford, Oh, Dodge. And that, like all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, the day we're, we're really loyal to our companies. Um, we're really proud to work there. I mean, you go back to the thirties and when people died, they, they literally get buried with their Ford badge. Um, I mean, we're, we're really proud of the work that we do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to save this industry for the generation coming after us. Um, when I started in 2012, the starting wage was $15.78. In 2023, it, at GM, it is $16.67. And, and that's what your conditions are for two years, um, the, which is when you're mandatory hired. But... If you break time for 30 days, so if you go through pretty much any layoff, <laughs> your time restarts. Um, and then after you're hired in, you have an eight-year growing pay scale. So for 10 years of your life, you're not at top pay. For 10 years of your life, you're trying to figure out how are you going to make ends meet? How, how do you save for retirement when you're, you can't even afford, afford rent? Like if you, if you look at the what an average two bedroom apartment goes for in any area where the big three have operations. I'm pretty sure Kentucky, cause I did the research for the members United campaign. Kentucky is one of the only places where you can actually afford a two bedroom apartment on that wage. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so we have a lot of systemic issues that we need to fix in this contract. And, and a lot of it was what we had already given up. Um, we, and we did it for the companies. We did it because of how proud we are of this industry. They came to us and they said, look, we're bankrupt. Um, and it wasn't the UAW's fault. This was poor management. I mean, they're building SUVs when gas is going through the roof in 2008. And they're watching all these other manufacturers build cars. And they are like, oh, well, let's double down on the SUV strategy. Um, I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was gross mismanagement, but we still gave. Um, and, and we gave because we wanted to protect the industry. Now we are going back to these companies and we're trying to save the industry. It's not about us. It's about, it's about everyone that's coming up after us. If my son or daughter decides to become a fourth generation UAW worker in one of these plants right now, I would, I would tell them to go anywhere else. Um, because it's it's not worth it. I mean, the the work, the toll it takes on your body. And then if you, if you give 30 years to any of these companies, now they don't want to give you a pension. Okay. Well, I mean, I gave you 30 of my best years. Like that's 30 years of missing family events. That's 30 years of you damaging and destroying my bodies. And then they also don't want to give you retiree health care because they don't want to fix you when they broke you. I mean, I can remember growing up and now that I think about it after 10 years, I can, and as a father, I can kind of put some sense into it, but like my dad would only play catch for, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes. And you know, you're, you're a kid and you're like, come on, dad, let's just keep on going. And you know, he's just getting done from work. And it's like, you know, I, I finally understand it. And it's like, these these conditions they need to change. I mean, we we can't 
we can't allow multi-billion dollar companies to run people ragged like this. I mean, there's no reason. You have people working 90 days straight, 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. The longest I, I ever worked was 21 days in a row. And I was lucky. I consider myself lucky again at that time because I was in material. But guess what? That's still 21 days in a row. You're sitting, cranking your back, looking backwards. I mean, because you got to... you you're in a factory. You know, the moment you're not twisted backwards and you're not watching where you're going, the moment you take your eye off that aisle, you could kill somebody. I mean, it's that serious. These, these plants, like it, it's, it's, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just this, this needs to change and it needs to change now because if we can't win this, if we can't win this, what, what, what's going to happen to the rest of labor. And as we transition to EVs and they're about to lose their, uh, it takes about 30% less of the workforce. Um, so where's that 30% going to go? Well, the big three wanted to go into Mary Barra's and, uh, Carlos Tavares. They wanted to go into their po pocket pocketbook but it in the reality it's got to benefit the workers i mean we got to stop letting these corporations get away with highway robbery for example gm reinstated the dividend at their company um they've spent about five billion dollars on it if they re if they instead of reinstating the dividend if they give every worker a raise it would be about a seven dollar an hour raise for every single employee for the same amount that they're given to the shareholders for literally, they don't even hold a piece of paper. It's just an, uh, an electronic share that pops up on their, um, <laughs> on, on their, their app, like Charles Schwab or whatever. I mean, it's, it, you push people that care and, and they truly give a shit about your company and you push them beyond their breaking point beyond the the normal lengths of human endurance and eventually people are going to start to snap and i think that's what you're seeing in the in this round of contract negotiations i think that's what you're seeing with the reform movement um people just they, they're fed up they're sick of it they didn't want business as usual they wanted somebody to win a transformational historic contract record Profits make record contracts. It's it's a great background, <laughs> but I mean it's it's the god honest truth. I mean how how can we as workers and and as a society sit there and talk about the the workers' demands and oh these are these are unimaginable demands. We can't possibly give these demands, but we never question the CEOs when they're giving um, they're spending all this money on stock buybacks when they're giving their CEOs outrageous salaries when they're spending money on the dividends i mean if if we if we really want to be competitive well, let's look at our ceo pay and compare it to toyota toyota 4 million dollars mary barra 29 million dollars like i mean it's not a worker problem this is a corporate greed problem and we got to fix it we got to get back to having responsible corporations paying their workers decent wages with decent conditions with decent benefits and getting back to the way unions and labor used to fight and in the used to be because we've seen what happens when labor grows complacent we've seen what happens when labor doesn't fight and we just got to get back to our roots and i think that's what's happening right now well, and, and you make uh, all of you, I mean, like really important um, points here and, and that, but that last one really sticks with me, right? Because I've been very open uh, about this on the show and elsewhere, right? That I grew up very conservative, you know, in, in, uh, in Southern California, not a very, in Orange County, no less, that was not a very union friendly place. Um, you know, Marcy can tell you, like, you know, it's like kind of dicey, especially if we're talking about the 90s and the early aughts. Um, and the narrative that I always heard as a young conservative with no real connections to organized labor, like I had some. Like on the Mexican side of the family, there were there were some union workers, um, but they didn't talk about it that much, at least not with us. But the whole narrative I was always told growing up. Right. Was like was it was based on your industry. Right. It was based on examples like Flint 
and Lordstown and Chrysler in, in 1980, right? And what that narrative was was like unions and union workers got too greedy. They asked for too much, and the poor, you know, uh, American auto companies had no choice but to, you know, close up shop, drop economic nukes on entire communities, close plants, take those jobs abroad, um, pay workers, you know, in, in other countries far less, would deal with far fewer labor laws and environmental regulations, because that's what they had to do to stay profitable. And businesses need to be profitable, right? This was the common wisdom that I grew up with. And it's like, uh, uh, well, first off, Let's let's you know, I got we got a lot of problems with that narrative. But like, I think the the point that y'all made is just so important where it's like, well, why the F are we not applying the same standard to the executives and the shareholders like like if they are paying themselves billions of dollars, if they are more profitable uh, than they've ever been off your backs, um, is anyone going to stop and say like, hey, these vultures at the top are literally like siphoning all of the wealth out of our communities. Uh, you know, they, they, like they're not hurting. They don't. It's not the union's fault. It's not a worker problem. It's a corporate greed problem, as Nick said. Like, when is that? When are we going to make that turn as a culture? When are we going to apply the same kind of uh, 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 just like conviction with which we have talked about? the decline of the auto industry as a cipher for like the problem with unions in this country in general and workers demanding too much. When are we going to apply that kind of standard or that kind of criticism to corporate America while they are making billions and billions of dollars? Like, that's what I want to know just as a, as an American at this point. But I, I could talk to you guys for hours, but I know you've got busy lives. You've got busy jobs. You're in the midst of this contract fight. And I promised you, I wouldn't keep you longer than an hour. So like, if I can just a few more minutes, I want to kind of end on that note of like, what happens now? Right? Um, like, like, let's bring the focus back to the contract. Um, you know, we, we haven't we haven't even talked about uh, much the, the reform movement that led to y'all, uh, you know, ousting the previous administration, uh, voting in, you know, like through the, the, the reform Unite All Workers for Democracy caucus, really rallying behind a new administration, winning all the seats that you contested uh, before that passing a referendum that meant that UAW members would vote more democratically for their union leadership, a one-member, one-vote system as opposed to the previous delegate system, which enabled the, the, the previous administration to stay in place for so many years, right? This is very similar to what we saw play out with the Teamsters, right? We all know the, the, the history of the corruption, the mob, Hoffa. There's a lot of dark stuff in the, in the Teamsters' past, even as as it is a storied and important union that has done so much good for working people in this country. But of course, it's got a lot of bad skeletons in the closet as well. And so after that all came to a head in the 80s and 90s, the Teamsters were forced to have democratic elections within their union. And that is what laid the groundwork decades later for that union to elect Sean O'Brien and, and their reform slate. And then Sean O'Brien and that new administration coming in, rallying UPS Teamsters and saying, we are turning the tide. No more concessionary bargaining, uh, you know, like no more of this working us to death crap. Like we are coming back to get what is ours. And we just saw them, you know, like win a historic contract. There's always more fighting to do. As we know, there's always more that we need to get back. The contract is not perfect, but it's a shit ton better than what Teamster UPSers have been getting for many, many years. Y'all are in a similar situation, right? We know that the UAW leadership has been rife with corruption. The FBI just like, you know, did a multi-year investigation that landed multiple leaders, including two former UAW presidents in prison, right? Like that's bad. 
But what I want people listening to understand is like that doesn't just mean you give up on the union and you and you say, you know what, like I'm just going to trust my employer to treat me nicely. <laughs> right? I'm going to I'm going to put all my hope in my boss because my my union leaders are corrupt. No. You take hold of that union. You fight with your coworkers to make it better and to better represent you. That is what UAW members did. That's an incredible feat. They they got one member, one vote. And then they used that new voting system to vote in this reform slate with John Fain as UAW president. Now, he, with the members who are rallying behind him in this contract fight, are ready to come to, to go to the mat, right? <laughs> and, and say, like, you know, yeah, we're not taking more of these concessions. We're we're not sitting idly buy while y'all rake in record profits and pay out shareholder dividends and all that crap. Like we are coming back for what's ours. So this is like a, I wanted to just smush that in because the reform movement discussion, we could do a whole other podcast on that. Um, but I want to just make sure that folks like understood, like it, it's been mentioned by our great panelists. I just wanted to give y'all some of that context before we hit this final question, kind of a rapid fire round around the table. Then I promise I'll let everyone go. Uh, I just wanted to ask if we could go back around and, and, and highlight like any key issues that you want listeners to, to focus on. Like, like what is this fight really about? About what are the issues that y'all are prepared to go on strike over? Um, and most importantly, what can we all do within the labor movement and beyond? What can people, uh, working people do to stand in solidarity with y'all if a strike happens or not? Hey, that's a lot to unwrap there. <laughs> Let's see. Um, first of all, yeah, I'm just uh, so uh, glad at, of the transparency from our newly elected leadership. You know, I think they're doing a great job at getting the rank and file fired up. You know, we we mean business. You know, now and I just came like right before this. We had our practice picket at our union hall. We have another one coming up this Friday. So I would just you know urge people to to support us. You know. If, if you see us on the picket line, support us if you can. Give us a honk. Uh, donate to our strike pantry. You know, uh, pass out some gas cards, whatever you can to support. And, you know, workers just need to support each other. You know, like we're we're all fighting for like decent living wages and conditions, you know, coming in um, after, you know, 2013, I'm not considered a legacy employee, but because I'm trades, you know, I, I didn't have to start at a lower tier, but I don't have a pension. I don't have lifetime medical, you know, these are, are issues that are important to me, you know, like um, obviously, you know, we all need huge or wage increases uh, across the board because we see what what profits these companies are making and um you know it's it's time for them to to give back what what everyone has lost these past you know over a decade now 15 years um almost so yeah like i said just support support our 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 pickets, our uh, contract, you know, let's not, let's not fight each other over, well, you shouldn't make this, or you should just be happy you have a job. You know, I hate seeing, I'm so, I hate reading the comments on, on any of the, the union, you know, posts that, that I see, like, I just try to ignore it. But if, if you're fed up, then, then organize a union in your own workplace, you know, whether it's an office or a factory or a store, you know, uh, you deserve better wages and benefits too. So I'll leave it at that. Well, I'm happy you did mention um, the reform, one member, one vote. That was the best thing since sliced bread. I can say that because um, I did used to be in leadership and I did consider um, our former presidents and VPs as my superiors. That was such a slap in the face and what we endured. And it was vital, vital that we had one member, one member, uh, one member, one vote pass. I am so happy that we have Sean Fain as our president and the rest of the IEB board that did get elected. What people had to realize, these individuals was part of the rank and file just months ago. They was in these plants. They had endured everything that we're talking about 
have talked about for this past hour, they knew everything that we experienced. So it is so important that these individuals are in these positions that they are in. And that's why this contract will be epic. It will be epic. Record profits, record contracts, that is that that's the sum of everything what Sean been saying. We are not trying to be greedy. We just ask them for our piece of the pie. We do not care what the CEOs are making. If just think, if they will give us a couple of million of dollars of what they're getting um, a year out their $24 million salary and gave it back to the members, that would that would be that would be epic. We're not asking for much. All we asking for is our due diligence. And I I do have a pension, but I do want my brothers and sisters that came in there after me to have a pension because even the ones that have a pension, they didn't even realize I had to tell a full-time worker that has, that has a pension. I said, they don't get nothing after they when they leave, literally. And she's like, what you mean? I said, they don't have dental um, um, glasses. They don't have nothing. They just quit. And she was like, oh, my God. So I'm, this last week, this last week, I'm telling someone this. So that's the division that this has caused. And that's why it's so important for them to get a pension also. They, their bodies um, hurting just as like our body hurting. My feet ache. When I get off the car, I have to calm down and just sit in the car for a minute because my feet is hurting. Their feet are hurting. Their back's going to be hurting. They're not going to be able to see. They may need dentures. This is what we are talking about. Yes, we had to go back and say, hey, we're not going to offer pensions, but they did make a deal and say, hey, once we do better, we're going to give back. Now, all that then went out the window, and they just want to say, oh, we just got these workers, and this is what it is. No, this is not what it is. This is not what it has to be. We all are one big family in the UAW, and if we get pensions, they need to have pensions too. COLA, everything that we're asking for, we're not asking for much. We just asking just for a little. And I love to come back because it was so much that need to be said as well. But I love Sean Fane and I thank him for everything that he is out there trying to do. And I pray for his mental health because this stuff is not easy. Mentally, physically, none of it. I pray for all the our union leadership. Thank you. Yeah, it's just... Um... You know, anybody that if if you think your union's not working, I mean, UAWD, TDU, we have proven that you can you can reform your union. You can transform your, your union. Your union is not the leadership. You are the union. The rank and file is the union. The, the union is not an outside entity. It is you. If you have a problem with it, step up and change it. And you can change it in a really big way. Um, how can people support us? I mean, there's the obvious things like come down to our picket line and talk to talk to our uh, talk to people. I told you this, Max, on our last interview. You know, that's at my plant. That'd be two thousand different stories, um, two thousand different reasons of why people are standing out there. But more importantly, if you really want to support us, if you really want American manufacturing to exist, we got to buy union made products that are built here you got to support your communities and and you got to check your vins and make sure you know they're not built somewhere else if you want these jobs to stay here if you want these jobs to to be good for the next generation i mean that's a really big part of it is is <clears throat> supporting union labor supporting hardworking people like those on this call and the 150,000 of us across the nation um 
And it's so much bigger than just us because for every every job in the auto plant, it supports seven, I've seen numbers, seven to nine jobs outside of it. That's in the supply chain, right? So you got your suppliers and all of these people depend on this industry. I mean, this is a big, this is over a million jobs we're talking about that's going to be affected if we go out. So, so come down to our picket lines, um, support us, talk to us. You know, we're not, <laughs> we're not unfriendly people i mean this is this is i mean we're just we're everyday people like you like like the person that you you wave hi to as you're driving down the street you know you give them the two finger the three finger wave whatever whatever your choice is on the steering wheel i mean we're we're just like you we just wanna we just want our fair shake at the table we want these jobs to be good paying jobs and we want corporate america to stop fleecing the workers I mean, that's what this is. They, the, the Sean always says the talking heads say class warfare, but it's only class warfare when, when the working class people start stepping up. And I'm sorry if you can hear my son in the background. It's getting to be his bedtime, and he wanted to come down and say hi. Um, so I just, just, just thank, thank you guys um, for for coming. Thank you, Max, for for having us on. And I would, I mean, there's so much. I mean, we could sit down and we could probably talk for five hours. I mean, there's there's so much that can be said about this fight. And, and what it's going to mean. And, and I can't wait to read the analysis of it from labor notes and everything else in the future and, and the real news network and see what you guys have to think about it. But I, uh, I appreciate you guys and thank you for having me. Thank you again for having me as well. And I honestly, I didn't even um, know about this podcast, but I am a subscriber to in these times. So I get the uh, magazine at home, a hard copy. Yeah. In these times rocks, baby. Thanks, Max. And I will subscribe as well and start oh. supporting your podcast. I think this is a wonderful communication piece for the working class and for everything that you're trying to do. So I would love to support you as well. Hey, while uh, everyone's here, is it okay if I share a little screen grab of all of us uh, sitting here and say, get ready for a, an awesome podcast that's about to drop and take y'all? on uh, Twitter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, let me let me stop the recording real quick. So Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.